When the doctor shook his head and said she's gone You could feel the mother's heart break You could hear them cry and boy Her little girl was only 12 years old Somewhere in the distance He's moving to Texas. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. Glad to be Sorry. here. Uh, everybody's saying, why are you moving to Texas? So I, guess I, I say, why not? I need to tell you the story. I, I spent 30 years in Texas, and then I went up to Washington. Uh, but my wife has a sister and a brother, and her husband has a sister and two brothers. They live kind of in the same place, about 70 miles east of Dallas on a lake. <laughs> that has a golf course, <laughs> golf courses on it. <laughs> so last August we went down and we bought a couple of building lots and we've had our plans designed. And I'm running point this week, this trip, 
to go down and meet the builder and get the building permit for the end. And so I'm going to have the lake in my front yard, and the ninth hole is in my backyard. <laughs> and it was really something because I was kind of wondering if, uh, when my brother passed away, I kind of just got this feeling, you know, I thought, you know, I want to be sure my family's in a good place, you know, my wife and, you know, because if you lose your network, it's, it's kind of bad. And so yeah. that's why we made the decision to go back to where her mom, her mom's 60 minutes away. And uh, so we were overseeing our kids in eastern Washington, and as we were driving back, I was beat bopping along about 70 on the interstate playing the Statler Brothers. And uh, it was some religious music. And I looked over at her, and she just had these big crocodile tears going down her cheek. And, and she's really soft hearted, and so I just kind of patted her on the knee and drove on. And, and she never tells me much about how she feels. It's always whatever you want to do, you know? And so. Uh, that night, right before bed, she comes in and turns the TV off and sits down beside me and says, I guess I should tell you why I was crying this afternoon. And I said, well, if you want to. And she said, I was just, I thought it was the music. <laughs> she says, I'm just so happy that we're going back to Texas and I can be close to my mom and my sister. And I thought, well, did something right, man. <laughs> so we're going to be from her sister that they are really, really close and they've never lived within 400 miles of each other. We're going to be one mile by boat and three Praise miles by the, by the road around the lake. <laughs> and uh, we'll be coming back through in March for the move. And we'll be here probably for Wednesday night service. Thursday. 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 We have Thursday night service. Okay, well, we'll Don't come you. Wednesday. We won't meet. Well, we, will. we do have church here Wednesday night, but not ours. If you come, I guess we could have service. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say. You. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Well, this song that I'm going to sing came out of the Pensacola Revival. That's the only time I ever heard it. And uh, someone's mentioned it to me recently that I hadn't sung it in a while. Uh, I wish I'd have brought my Bible up here because I wanted to read out of, I believe it's the 19th chapter. That's okay, I don't have it. Revelation. But where it talks about him coming with the saints riding on white horses. He's coming, church. And I believe this is a prophetic song. It says he's gathering his... Well, he is really, because we got to get prepared now. We can't wait till the trumpet sounds. we got to already be ready. Now, is this young man I know earlier? That's your nephew? Yeah. Oh, um, grandson. Your grandson. Yeah, he's been here before, right? Yes. yes. I don't know. Did, was this added? Or was yeah. It? Yeah. 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 I kept looking at it. I think that's him, but I don't remember your name, honey. Yeah. James. James. All right. That, that, that rings a bell. Yes. Okay. We will ride. Yeah. He has fire in his eyes. And the sword in his hand, and he's leading his army all across this land, and he's calling out to you and me, Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes, Lord, we'll ride with you.
has a crown on his head. He carries a scepter in his hand. And he's leading his arm. All across this land. And he's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride it with me? We say yes, Lord, we'll ride with you. Let's sing this book. We say yes, Lord. We will stand up and fight. We she happened to see us riding this horse. I've told this before. My cousin's house when I was still in Texas, at Lake New, Texas. We had a slumber party. That's when somebody tried to teach me how to smoke. <laughs> it's probably about 14, maybe, something like that. They said, we had outhouses. How many know what an outhouse is? So they said, there's a pack of cigarettes in the outhouse if you want to go try it. So I thought, well, I don't want to be a chicken. So I go to the outhouse and I light up a cigarette. It didn't take me long to throw it down that toilet. I thought, my Lord, who would ever want to do this? But you know, I told you, I believe I got saved at 12 and I believe that was God that said, you don't want this. And I never did smoke another cigarette. I mean, I was a little bitty. My mom and dad smoked and they'd throw the butts out. You know, we take little swigs off of them as kids. I remember trying that, but never just to light up a cigarette and smoke it. Like, if they'd ever caught us, it'd been too bad. But, <laughs> but oh my 
goodness. Uh, but she saw us. She happened to drive by. My mother was a very protective mom. And I guess she was spying on us. We were out in the country a little bit. So she sees this horse out there. So mama comes and gets me and takes me home. Well, I met up with my cousin about eight years later, and we were laughing about that. She said that horse had rheumatism so bad, it couldn't even run. That was my experience with riding a horse. I've never ridden one since. I don't think I want to try it now. I think I'm, I'm just too far gone to want to try that now. And then I found out a few years ago that my gal that was my youth pastor, I found out she had my, they, I found this out years later, that she took my girl's bareback riding on a horse. I never knew about it. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm glad I didn't know probably. Hallelujah. One more song, the one I sung Thursday night, and uh, you're going to hear it again. I love you this much. Just for you, brother. What of you like it? I know Virgil really likes it. It's one of my favorite songs. As a child, I asked my mother, How much do you love me? Then she threw her arms wide open for my little eyes to see. Then she told me of a Savior on a hill so far away. When I heard how much he loved me, my life has never been the same. I love you this much. Then he opened his arms and died for me. I love you this much. As he bowed his head.
even there tonight. But while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, He died for us. <laughs> I thank God. I thank God. We, can, we cannot even imagine the depths of His love and of His mercy and the sacrifice that He made at the cross. I never saw the passion. Some of y'all saw it? How many of y'all saw it? I never did get to see it. Somebody had it on a DVD. I suppose I could get it and watch it. But uh, they said it's pretty gruesome. But, it, you know, he really got into a lot of trouble. The Catholics over that. But truth is truth. The Jews. Truth is truth. I guess the Jews more than the Catholics. But truth is truth. The Bible says he was so marred that he was unrecognizable. And they, I think they painted it, from what I understand, pretty graphic. Well, how many have enjoyed Brother Ray Valentine? And yeah. Brother Ray, Brother Ray, I'm here, preached a wonderful message for us uh, Thursday night. We appreciated it so much. And Brother Ray, now let me say again, how many have enjoyed Brother Ray Valentine? Yeah. yeah. Amen. He's a keeper. Now, Brother McGarry, I will ask you to preach. I know you'll do it. Are you able? All right, so we'll, we'll just set you on the schedule. Brother Ray, we'll schedule him to preach. I, I've kind of been merciful on him, and then I found out he's preaching at the men's ministry, so I thought, well, if Ray don't have any mercy on him, I'm not either. <laughs> Vanina, will you forgive me for asking him to preach? I know it's hard on him, but he's not going to ever admit it. But anyway, we'll do that, brother. We'll get together about when, okay? All right, Brother Ray, I'm ready for you. And uh, somebody can, you can help me down off of this thing, I guess. Just give me a little a hand with this crazy thing here. Oh, I am. I am. I am. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> I can do it. Thank you for those anointed, precious songs. I was sitting back of that chair, and I was wondering, is there fish in that lake by the golf course? They start finding in April. Bass? Bass. Bass. <laughs> My heart goes out to you. Bless your heart. How many of you know that this word is true? Amen. I was reading where 44 different men inspired by the Holy Ghost wrote this. One would pick up a pen and write, and then as the Holy Ghost moved on someone else, they would write. And they wrote this over a span of 200 centuries. Think of that. 44 men writing over a span of 200 centuries. And yet there's not any contradiction and it flows together. Isn't that amazing? Amen. I don't know how anybody could not believe every word of this and be aware that Jesus is coming back very, very soon. Amen. I was out at the range this last Friday and Somebody brought up this man and introduced him to me. He used to be, was raised up here in Arizona and pastored a church back east. And he's reached the age of retirement. Again, I don't understand that because he's a lot younger than me. But he's reached the age of retirement and has, I believe, resigned the church. And he's here visiting and he's fixing to go back. And he heard I was a pastor, and, uh, and so we was introduced, and after a while he left, and then I went back to the range and was shooting some skeet. 
And after, I don't know, it seemed maybe 30 minutes, here he came back. And I mean, he, he was coming with enthusiasm. And he came up to me and he says, I know you. I know you. I know you. And I thought, <clears throat> okay. And he said, I was at a church. And you was going to go to another church and you had written a skit. I'm sure Kat had seen it, The Rich Man and Lazarus. And we did that at several different churches and maybe even at youth camp. And I was going to do this at the Church of God. And he said, you recruited me. And he says, I'm just a kid and I played the beggar man in that. And he says, it was so powerful and so impressive. He said that I've never been able to forget it or get it out of my mind. And I thought, I wonder what part that played when I'm looking for some kids that will play a rich man and a beggar man and, and, and come to church and see the power of God fall like we used to in old time Pentecost. And it just did my heart good. And I am made to realize and believe that everything that we do for God is important. Yes. And I believe that it is important that we as Christians in the church draw closer together, not just to God, that's without saying, but as brothers and sisters in Christ. I told the men and the women that goes for you also, we need each other. Amen. We need to be for each other. We need to pull for each other. Yes. We need to pray for one another. We need to physically help each other. We need to, you know, as closer do we get as each other, we will automatically get closer to God. Amen. And I believe that we need to have a love like we've never had before. It seems like there's so much, and I'm glad I don't know a bit of it being here, but a lot of places there's so much backbiting and criticism and jealousy. No wonder it hinders the work of God. But if we just begin to love one another, I believe we're going to see a change in our lives and in the church. I was talking to the men's group and I said there's an attitude. And we as young children are taught that. That we are independent, that we really don't need anybody else, that we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, that, that, that we're not going to borrow, we're not going to ask, we're not going to beg, we're... we're we can do it by ourselves. We, can, we don't need anybody. That song, I'll do it my way. And with that attitude, goes against the very will of God. And is something that Satan absolutely plants in our heart. I found this, and it says this. There's perhaps no more chilling example of the independent spirit taken to the extreme than in the tragic criminal life of Timothy McVeigh. He lived most of his life outside the boundaries of dependence on others. He lived as an outcast, an extremist, refusing to place himself under any authority, let alone the United States government, which he despised. Free to do completely as he pleased, he did the unthinkable. He took the lives of 168 innocent Americans, many of them children, when he bombed the federal office building in Oklahoma City. After a long manhunt and months of legal mentoring, Timothy McVeigh was sentenced to death by lethal injection for that vicious crime. Throughout the entire ordeal, he maintained an eerie, calm composure, not once showing even a shred of her most remorse or regret. Defiant and proud, he accepted his fate as a martyr for his demented cause. He was asked how he could face death with such resolve. And he said he was unafraid. And asked why he said that he controlled his own fate. And then he cited the following poem written 
over a century ago by William Ernest Hindley. And the poem says this, Out of the night there covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole. I think wherever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeon of chance, my head is bloody, but it's unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and still finds me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate, and I am the captain of my soul. He went out into eternity like that. And as I read that, I thought, what an evil spirit. And I see not to that extreme. For none of us would think of going out and doing something like that. But I see the spirit of self-dependence and leave me alone. I'll do it my way. I'm right, you're wrong. And this spirit is being taught in our families. And church, I am here to tell you that that is not God's plan. I need Him. And I am not too proud, but I tell you, I need you. I need you when I'm discouraged. I need you when my wife falls. I need you when sickness comes. I need you when I don't know how to fix my automobile. I need you when I'm hurting. I need you. Yeah. And we need each other. Amen. God's plan has never been for us to be a lone ranger or a one man army. He meant for us to be together. I think in Quickly in the Bible, when God first created Adam, he said it's not good that man should live alone. And in Deuteronomy, we find the words that one should put a thousand to flight, two put ten thousand to flight. Matthew 18, 20 says, when two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst. James says, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. And they'll come and they'll anoint and pray for them. And I'll raise up. Just call for the elders of the church. You need help at a time like this. And then Philip, when he left that great revival meeting, and there he met, and he, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And God says, join yourself. Get up there and help them understand. We need each other. I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes when Brother Chris was here. He embarrassed me. He said he had never preached from Ecclesiastes. He says, I, I haven't heard anybody preach from that. And he pointed back and says, have you ever preached from it? Well, I've wore out. In fact, I had to tape up this Bible to keep it together. Except surely I had. So I thumbed through it and I marked everything. And I have never preached. But preached from it. I can't even hardly pronounce it. I have <laughs> difficulty with my enunciation anyhow. But for the very first time in my life, I'm going to preach of this book. Tremendous book. I don't know why that I haven't preached on it. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me, Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, and I'm going to be reading from the eighth verse. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit that we have already felt with the anointed singing for those that is here to receive something from you. And you've never turned anyone away empty. Every time they came to you, you've met their need. So, Master, I pray that in this service that you will deal with us and may you realize that in times like these, especially in times like these, in the desperate and the very last times, we need you and we need each other. Yes. And help us. Oh, help us. Help us to be one. That was your prayer. Father, that they might be one. Cross closer together and use us, I pray. For your glory and the wonderful. We find these words I really don't need this, I just that I look better in them. <laughs> there is one alone, there is one alone, and there is not a second. Yet he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all of his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor and berave my soul of good? This is vanity, yea, it is a sore prevail. Notice these words, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth that he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they have heat, but if one, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. How many times in your life have you had to have someone? You needed to talk to someone. You needed someone to pray for you. You needed someone to help you. You just had to have some. Probably some of the saddest things that I see in the ministry that just grips me is, it, 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 and sometimes I've got to be honest with you, I'll, I'll see kids that are hooked on drugs and I've prayed for them and I've seen God set them free and it's a terrible, terrible thing. And, and I've seen alcoholics that God has set free and I've seen some that have staggered in and they've lost everything because of it. But I have to be honest. Down in my heart I have to say, you know, somewhere you allowed this to happen. Then I get it out of my mind, you know, but, but it's there. But really what gets my heart is when I meet people. And they're crying. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. What's the matter? I'm just all alone. I can find healing for the alcoholic or the drug addict. Or I can find, if they don't accept teaching, I can find some place, some organization that would have, but when there's someone who says, I lost a mate, I'm all alone. My kids left and I'm all alone. I can only pray, God, give this person peace because I have no way that I can help that individual. I have no place that I can tell them to go where they might seek help. And it breaks my heart when someone says I'm old. Church, I'm telling you that your spiritual life will change, the church will change, revival will come. 
When we genuinely love each other, not say so, but when we prove it, when we start hugging necks, shaking hands, is there anything that I can help them? We stop criticizing each other and love them no matter what. Then will we see things. Oh, this is an important thing. This is what the whole Bible is about, love. And there is no more important time now than we find someone to join ourselves to them and love them. Paul, what a great man of God that he was, wrote so much of the New Testament. Oh, we, we hardly ever preached any sermons in a row without talking about Paul. And yet Paul had to learn what I'm trying to tell you. Paul is going down Damascus Road, the light, the conversion. Ananias owes, oh, what an experience. We know that so well. But after that conversion, there are some things that happen in his life. And it takes years for him to get it. And God cannot use him until he gets it. He can't help the church at Corinth. He, he, he can't go on the mission. He can do nothing until he gets this. That is Paul. You're a young, educated man. You've got authority. And you go like a bull in a gate. You answer to no one. You do it your way. You persecuted the Christians with vigor. You, you, you didn't let anybody get in your way. You didn't need to talk to anybody once you got the letter. You just went and put children, women, men in prison. Even to just get out of my way. Now you've seen the light. And you've accepted me as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And you're going into the ministry, but there's some things you're going to learn before you really become a... What? The Apostle Paul has got to get a lesson. There's something he needs to learn. Let's look at Acts the ninth. Chapter. And let's, we've, we've gone past the conversion and, 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 uh, and he's been saved, received his sight, and he's filled with the Holy Ghost. The scales is fell from his eyes and he is strengthened. And then we get to the 20th verse. This is where Paul begins to preach. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue. That is the Son of God. And all that heard him, notice they were amazed. This was one talented preacher. It wasn't like this to Brother Valentine. I mean, this guy could preach. They were amazed and they said, Is this not he that destroyed them, which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither? For that intent that they might bring him bound unto the chief priest. I mean, they, 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 there were some that didn't like that straightforward preacher. You know, he, he's young at this time. He's a young preacher. And, 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 oh, listen. Oh, listen. A young preacher can be dangerous. <laughs> and, and, and he's dangerous, right? If I was pastoring a church and I needed somebody to fill in for me, I wouldn't get a young preacher. Mm -mm. They can be dangerous. I said some things that I, when I first started preaching, I don't, I don't even like, I don't even like to think about. I mean, here, here, saw these kind of the people. You know what I said one time? I, I was at a church, and that was back in the days when you know the women had long hair, no one wore makeup and stuff. And I looked out there and I says, "Well, I'm not going to preach about makeup out there, but I'll tell you, ladies, something. Whenever a barn gets on fire, the first thing that happens, the old red paint begins to peel." <laughs> I'm 
to have my wife. I mean, you can be dangerous. And he is. And, and, and he's got the people upset. But, it, but in spite of that, by the grace of God, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And then after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying awake was known of Saul. Now listen, listen. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down the wall in a basket. Boy, this guy's preaching and he's growing strong. And I, I, I mean, he's got a meeting going. And then a group comes up to kill him. They've heard about enough of that. I know some of you listening in a long time. Don't go to that extreme, you know, the number two or three weeks. And they're going to kill. And the disciples, who we do not know who they are, they're unknown. They're just like us. Just we're just friends, aren't we? That's what it's just just a buddy, just a friend. That, 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 even when Paul writes later. In Corinth, and all of the writings later, he never mentions. We, we have no idea who these disciples are. But here come some buddies. And they let him down in a basket. And it was probably a fish basket. That was what the big baskets was. And I, I can just imagine. Can, can you imagine this man that was so educated? And this buddy said, hey, get in this smelly fish basket here and we're going to let you down with a rope and then you're going to run for your life. <laughs> Saul was learning something. At one time he could have barked orders and he didn't need anybody. But now to save his very life, he needs some unknowns. How many times in my life, Tim, when I was in trouble, and it wasn't the great evangelist Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or, or, or Brother Branham or somebody on television, but just some unknowns that love God. Nobody's. They came to my rescue. And God heard their prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You need to find a friend that's an unknown. It's not this governor's my friend or this person's my friend, but you find some Christian that knows how to get on their knees and pray through it until they touch God and move heaven in your behalf. Just an unknown. change your life. And then Saul has to leave there. He leaves Damascus and he goes to Jerusalem. Now he knows Jerusalem like the back of his hand. He went to school there. He was a top graduate. He was an educated man there. And in my mind I think, boy, Paul's coming to preach at Jerusalem. Let's get ahead of the Jerusalem news. Let's get some paper out. Let's get some posters up. Here comes Paul to preach a revival. He's going to stir this place. But that's not the way that it was. He got there and the Bible said, well, let's just read it. And when Paul was come to Jerusalem, he wanted to join himself to disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And when he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Here he is. I came to another place, to Jerusalem. I've had an experience like none, none of 
It ought to be written in the magazines. I ought to be a TV star. Who else was blinded? I mean, if there ought to be a headline preacher, it ought to be me. And the disciples just scared him. We don't trust this guy. He's got a past. We know what it is. This is a dangerous man. How many of you have been rejected because before you met Christ, you had a past? And it seems like they can't get it out of their mind. Your past comes up. You had a child that was locked up. You went through a divorce. You, you, you was drunk one time and did something wrong. You, you might have even served time. You got a past and then you met the master and, and he set you free. But people won't forget the past. Stay away from him. I knew him when. Do we want him in our congregation? Do you know that 10 years ago? Look at him with all the tattoos. And, and, and I'm not preaching for it. I preach against it. But I'm saying it's in the past. Paul is learning he needs somebody. This great man that's writing so much of the Bible at this time is a young person. He's stuck. And he needs somebody. And here comes Barnabas. Come on, Paul. Saul, come on. I, I'm going I'm to vouch for you. I, I'm going to speak up for you. Come on. We're going to get this thing straight down. And he went to the disciples and says, Hey, I've heard this man preach in Damascus. This man is mightily used of God. He's not who he was. Mm -hmm. He's not even, he's the opposite of what he was. He met the master and the master turned him around and the master called him and the master was using him. Don't be hindering him. This is a child of God. It's in the past. But oh, you ought to know this man. You need a Barnabas in your life at times. I, I, I'm not asked to sing. I've got a past. I'm not asked to preach. I've got a past. I would really like to, but I'm kind of ashamed that I dropped my head. It's in the past. Let me tell you that if God has forgiven you, it is our responsibility with joy to forgive you and walk hand in hand with fellowship for you're a child of the King. You've got a title that there's none ever greater. I am redeemed. I'm a child of the King. And woe not to you, but to those <laughs> who say, I don't need him because I need you. And Jesus needs you. Now they're going to kill him again. And it says, which when the brethren knew, they brought him. Who in the world's a brethren? But the yeah. brethren. A name. You can search from cover to cover. You don't know who they are. They're heroes, but you don't know who they are. But I'm in trouble when I didn't know my wife was going to make it when, when, when I had cancer and you prayed for me. I don't know exactly who touched God, maybe all of you, but you're heroes. But I don't. But what will drive you to pray for one another? If you love them. It's not just when my immediate family's in trouble that I pray. I need to have such a love for you that I can put my arms around. And you know that I'm touched because I weep in your behalf. Then, oh God, move. The brethren. Just a bunch of unknowns. Holy Spirit didn't even have their names recorded. And then Paul 
that's then called to go to Tarsus. Won't be much longer, folks, but listen. This is his hometown. You talk about humility. Holy Spirit, we're sitting here. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody knows me there. How about sending me? Oh, you're going to go home and you're going to learn something. Boy, God, help the church to know what humility is. <laughs> I got to tell you this. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Shall I have one? There, there was a minister retired him and his wife. And, oh, you talk about godly. He is one of the few people that I say that I, if, if I was... If I had the gift of criticism, I couldn't find nothing to criticize him and his wife about. I mean, you, you went to the house, you wasn't going to find a comic book, you wasn't going to find nothing in the house, there wasn't going to be a TV, you're not, I mean, yeah, I, this man was a man of God. And he got older, and as they got older, his wife, man, she could sing, but she got where she couldn't sing anymore. And, 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 and some years went by and her voice would crack. And, and you know what? She wanted to sing. And she would get up and she'd sing maybe three or four lines. And she'd sit down. And she passed away. And then this man's daughter took care of him and, and, and at her house. And he was really getting feeble. And she called me one time and she says, Could you come over and stay with Dad? And says, I've got... The, the, a lunch for each of you in the icebox, and, and you can warm it up, and, and I have to leave now, it was an emergency, and how long would it take you to get here? And I says, I'll be there really quick, and you'll come, and you'll take care of him. And I says, yeah. Mentally, he was starting to lose some things, but he was, he was pretty sharp. And we, I got over there, and I knocked on the door, and I seen him coming to the door, or it was nighttime, or I rang the doorbell, and he was coming in his walker and he got a wheel stuck. And he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't get to the, he's fighting that. I'm standing looking in the window and I thought, do I break the window? I've got to get in there. And, and, and pretty soon he got the wheel unstuck and he got to the door. Oh, he was so happy to see me. And we went in and we got the food out and, and she had fixed a nice steak for me and, and for him it was kind of like baby food stuff. And, he sat down, he says, I'm going to eat this, you eat that. And, okay, so I'm eating the baby food junk and, and, and watching him try to eat my steak. Now, see, I'm not liking what I'm eating, and he can't chew what is supposed to be mine. And so, so, so finally, I give up. We just decided we had about enough of the food, and we went down and sat down. And we talked a little bit about the past, and, and, and I asked him how things was going to be. It's amazing what's important when you get older and you don't have... And, and, and he was all excited. And he says, Brother Valentine, guess what I've got? He says, I really like them. And I says, what? And he says, some new style depends. <laughs> uh huh. And he says, he got up and he said, I'm going to get you one and you try it all. <laughs> and I didn't want to. Uh, no, I really didn't want to. I thought him and me and, uh, and we're going to play checkers. <laughs> and, and so he started off. And I says, John. I would do anything for this man, but please don't ask me to put them on to comfort him and be happy with him. God, I just don't want to do it. I didn't. And then finally he lost his train of thought just about the time he got to where they was at. And he came back and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and 
And I honestly thought, what if God tells me that that's a plan of his? There's humility and then there's just, mm. Saul is learning humility. This great educated man. And he's back in his hometown. He's there for about four or five years. <coughs> and he can say, God, this experience now, I've, I've been to Damascus and Jerusalem, now I'm, I'm hometown. Let me preach. I've got a message and the church needs me. I'm called and no, no the church don't need me. No, read. The 30th verse says, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Syria and sent him to, to this is hometown Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and they were multiplied. They don't need him. In fact, if, 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 you, if, you, if you turn the next chapter, uh, the very next verse, it starts talking about Peter. There's nothing about Paul. Next chapter, there's nothing about Paul. There's nothing about Paul. There's nothing about Paul. I turn a page. Nothing about Paul. Nothing about Paul. Nothing about Paul. Nothing about Paul. I turn a page and I get there over to th things is going great. They're having a revival. And he's making tents. And the church don't need him. If he did anything at the church, if he ever preached a sermon, if he, if he ever got to do something, the Bible doesn't record it. You'd think some, he's there at least four years, probably five years, and there's nothing. The church is doing fine and God is still teaching him a lesson. Get this. Well, I'll preach to me. Raymond Valentine, do you know that don't ever get so important that you think the church needs you because it doesn't. It wants you. God wants you, but he doesn't have to have you because without your preaching, the church of the living God is going on and is going to go through victory and is going to be mighty and going to be victorious and going to do things. It's going to be a white church like she was talking about without spot wrinkles. For God's going to have a bride for his son with or without me. <laughs> so you're called and you've had a marvelous experience. But don't ever get to thinking that now you've got to be in charge that, that, that we can't get along without you because we're just doing fine without you. I'll tell you why I get stirred up. I'd like to preach to a bunch of preachers. I'd like to tell you how many times that I've met them and they say, well, I'd like to go down there, but how much money do they pay? I'd like to, I'd like to go down there, but are they going to support me? I'd like to, I, I've heard singers that wouldn't sing unless the crowd was big enough. I'm going to tell you whether you sing or not, whether you preach or not, whether you teach or not, there's going to be a bride. Hallelujah for the Son of God. And I want to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Glory. I love you. You need to love each other. We're in this thing together, whether you sing, whether you preach, whether you come down the altar and just pray for somebody and pray in tune to the Holy Spirit, whether you help them through prayer. We need to love oh, Virgil. We need to love it. This thing is real. I preach to you all, but I'll listen. Listen. I'm driving an old pickup truck 
belonged to Lloyd Nash, my friend. And he came out to the range where we were shooting and walked up and said, Ray, I've got lung cancer and it's been smoking. I haven't smoked in over 20 years. But I mean, he said, church will help me in the ministry, but the doctor says that that's what's causing it. He said, that, they said I wouldn't live two more Christmases. And that was in October, November. I said, count this one. He said, yes. He came out and shot with me until about two weeks. I believe it was in May and he didn't show up. I found out that he was in hospice. She knows Betty Lloyd. And when he was in hospice, and he was losing it just before he died, and he told me that all of a sudden he was, he was laying there, his hand went up, and Betty said, honey, do you see something? And he said, yes. What do you see? He says, I see mama, <laughs> who was tremendous, all we've known them all their lives. And then she says, all of a sudden, his other hand went up, and he said, wow. Oh, wow. And he took his eyes Wow. Jesus is coming for us. Wow. We're going to catch this love in one of I mean, church, this is a precious church. I don't, if there's a problem, I don't know nothing about it. But I'm going to tell you something. There's still room for us to love each other. Well. How do I do that? Well, when your brother, sister comes down to the altar and we got to go, but they, they wouldn't have went down there. They had a need. And Jesus, I don't know what the problem is, but I love this brother. I love this sister. We're family. The Jesus, he's hurting right now. Would you touch him? I love this man. I love this sister. Touch him and heal him. Where two or three are gathered together. And this man says to me, there's somebody who really cares. Is that, his, is that so and so's voice? He's praying with me. I really need to know that I really have a friend. Virgil, when you called me the other day and got me laughing on the phone, you know what I was going through. I mean, I'm laughing until I'm hurting and, and, and something had happened that I just can't tell you about. If I had to talk to you, it was killing me. Instead of crying, I'm laughing. <laughs> Jesus, help us to love one another until laughter comes into church. Master, I thank you for what I feel right now, for your presence. Oh, we need to realize that we're not in this alone, that we can't do it alone. It wasn't your plan for us to be alone. And, and, and Master, there's none of us that is an outcast. And if we have a past that's been forgotten by you, God, help us if the church can't forget about it. Draw us, Master. Help us to repent. Help us to have a loved one for another like we've never had them. It is we love each other and you love us. In the prayer you prayed, Jesus, just before you left, Father, make them one.
And may that be so. I ask in your precious name. Amen. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Let's just praise him because he loves us so much. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, 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 glory to God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Could we have somebody come to the instruments? I'm, I'm, we're going to do something in just a moment. I believe God's going to bless us. We're going to pray for Marvell. She's feeling really weak. Claudine's got to go check on an eye that she's losing sight in Tuesday. But you know what I really want us to do? Now you guys know that I haven't held you long after the service, but I really feel that in the Holy Spirit to do this. I want us to come as they play something. I want us just to stand here. And I want you just to get next to somebody and pray with them. And whisper that you love them. Walk over to somebody else and say, I love you. Will you stand with me all over this place? Let's just do this. Let's just show each other that we love each other, that we love God. Come and gather down here with me. And I want some ladies to come around Marvell and we're going to pray for them. Well, it don't have to be formal. Let's just come and touch God for Marvell and Claudine and, and, and let each other know that we, that we love them, that we really care. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, people. Come on, people. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Heavenly Father, we 